For the third consecutive year, Senator Josh McCoon is trying to get his religious liberty bill through the legislature, but the going may be rougher than ever. Georgia business leaders are increasingly outspoken in their opposition. McCoon isn't backing down, he's doubling down. He says multinational corporations and their non-Georgia executives are to blame. They think that what their cultural norms, their liberal far-left cultural norms, should be applied to our state. And they... As the battle over RIFRA heats up in Georgia, Senator McCoon joins us live. Lawmaker starts right now. Welcome to another edition of Lawmakers and day four of the 2016 session of the Georgia General Assembly. I'm Bill Nygut. We're pushing through a busy first week and there's a lot of ground to cover tonight. Let's kick things off with Shelby Lynn and the latest from the Gold Dome. Hi, Shelby. Thanks, Bill. Governor Nathan Deal unveiled the largest spending plan in state history today for fiscal year 2017, an almost $24 billion spending plan. It includes pay raises for teachers and public employees, millions of dollars for education and construction projects, and health care funding. The governor's chief of staff, Chris Riley, says the record spending plan may sound like a massive budget proposal, and it does top the current budget by $2 billion, but he says it's below the highest per capita spending level seen in the early 2000s. When adjusted for inflation and population growth, per capita spending in FY 2017 will be $2,324, nearly identical to spending levels in 1998. Some of the highlights of the governor's 2017 spending plan include $825 million in funding for transportation projects, more than $300 million for teacher salary increases, including pre-K teachers, $109 million in health care spending, and $59 million in additional lottery funds for the Hope and Zell Miller scholarships. Mandatory spending in the budget, as you all know, consists of a large portion of the budget, and therefore mandatory spending constitutes approximately 83 percent of all state spending. This includes spending that is legally mandated and or dedicated as in spending on general obligation debt, service or lottery and motor fuel, motor fuel funding. 61% of mandatory spending is enrollment driven education programs. Education funding is a big focus in DEAL's 2017 budget. At the end of the day, it's our desire that local school systems utilize the money to put back furlough days, increase instructional days and at the end of the day, it's a salary increase for teachers. And again, that's the um, same approach that we're using for our state agencies, providing agency heads flexibility is equivalent to a 3%, but again, it needs to be driven based on merit, recruitment, and retention. It's not a one-size-fits-all. Every agency has different needs. There are other items in the spending plan, too, including money for educational initiatives in state prisons and $13 million in bonds to create a so-called re-entry facility for inmates getting ready to leave prisons. The Georgia Bureau of Investigations is also getting almost $5 million under the proposal. The other thing that we added was additional special agents to GBI. It's about $4.7 million. And we added five new toxicology uh, positions, again, to address some backlogs. The goal of the House Democratic Caucus remains steadfast. We want to make sure government works for everyone. Also today, House Minority Leader Stacey Abrams outlined the agenda for the House Democratic Caucus. Once again, they're focusing on expanding Medicaid with a new bill they say would help thousands of Georgians. But more than anything, this is about putting a stake in the ground because this is the last year Georgia can accept the dollars for free, almost $2.8 billion that we're leaving on the table in 2016 alone. Next year, we have to put in about 5%, uh, and after that, it'll be 10%. But the urgency of now is that we have families, we have communities, we have jobs that are being lost because we're refusing to accept dollars because we don't like whose name is on them. In trying to sell the idea to their Republican counterparts, Abrams says Medicaid expansion can also help to save failing rural hospitals. Louisiana is expanding Medicaid. The governor of Alabama has acknowledged that they may need to expand Medicaid because southern states, which are, have been the last to adopt Medicaid expansion, realize they can't afford not to. We can't afford to collapse entire counties in our rural communities because hospitals leave and put families in jeopardy. 
literally put lives at risk. A total of 33 bills are on their agenda. Other items this year include a paid sick leave act for Georgia workers and families and the Help Military Spouses and Veterans Licensure Act to make it easier for service members and their spouses to find work. When military spouses come to Georgia, if you're a nurse, if you're a doctor, if you are a lawyer, you can be restricted from being able to secure a license. And we have to make that easier because some families can go two to three years without being able to make a living. Another House Democrat, Representative Mary Margaret Oliver, is pushing a bill that would ban assault weapons. She was flanked by other members of the legislature and supporters from the religious community. But Oliver admits the most controversial part of her bill is the part that would require the owners of assault weapons to turn in their guns. I am open in an honest discussion, if I'm allowed to have an honest discussion, if there's a better way. Should we grandfather owners that own these weapons today? Should we do a licensing of people who wish to keep their gun and ban them in the future? This is an intelligent conversation that people can have. We'll be following all these bills as they make their way through the legislature, and we'll be following the budget hearings that start next week. From the Capitol, back to you, Bill. Thanks, Shelby. Tonight, we're going to take a deep dive into the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which uh, many people call RIFRA. It's a pet issue of Republican Senator Josh McCoon. He is going to start us off joining us to talk about where the bill stands right now. But also on deck tonight, we have Greg Bluestein, a political reporter for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, Representative Mary Margaret Oliver, and also joining us, Representative Buzz Brockway. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Look, uh, right now, you're the man of the hour on this RIFRA bill. Uh, we know that, to remind everyone, you passed it through the Senate last session, went to the House, House held it back, Nobody seemed to be eager to take it up. And now you've got the chair of the Judiciary Committee, which Mary Margaret Oliver serves on over in the House, saying, well, we don't take up Senate bills until after crossover day, day 30. Are, are they just, uh, you think this is another effort to just shut that bill down? Well, I think it's a clear message being sent to the over 2,000 delegates that attended the Republican State Convention in Athens who unanimously demanded that the House act on, the Sen on Senate Bill 129 as it passed the Senate, as well as the 11 uh, congressional district conventions around the state that took the same position. I mean, uh, having spoken to a number of conservative groups in the interim since we adjourned in April, it's obvious that the only Republicans who don't want to see us uh, pass this modest protection of religious liberty interests are under the gold dome. Let's, um, uh, before we go any further with the conversation and I bring everybody in, uh, let's listen to what uh, Senator, uh, I mean, uh, Representative Willard uh, told our Shelby Lynn down at the Capitol about the bill. If Senator McCoon wants to consider it at the appropriate time and makes a request, we'll give it consideration. But not before sure. crossover? I plan to. And it would take an emergency? If, if somebody tells me why it's an emergency, I said, we've got a, a constitutional provision in our federal constitution, our state constitution, guaranteeing us uh, freedom of religion. I don't know where there's something happening that causes the need to enact this bill today. Uh, Representative uh, Willard talking actually to our producer down there, Ray Mateer. Greg, uh, you're sitting right across from Senator McCoon. How, uh, how would you, as a reporter down there covering this thing, rate his odds of getting this thing passed this session? I think something will get past the session, but I don't know if it will be exactly the language that, that Senator McCoon wants. Um, it seems like the House is ready to pass, maybe it's uh, Speaker Ralston's uh, Pastor Protection Act. The Senate would probably, that version would probably go back to the Senate. Maybe uh, there's another bid to add the RIFRA language on the Senate. Whether or not the actual language gets signed by Governor Deal and passed, I think both, both members from both chambers will be able to say they voted on something. Whether or not it will actually become law becomes the big question. Were you disappointed that the governor did not mention RIFRA in any form in the state of the state yesterday? Did you, I mean, he's already said, he's kind of signaled he's not enthusiastic about it, I think. Uh, would you like to have heard him talk about it? Well, obviously, I mean, I would like Governor Deal. I would like Speaker Ralston. I would like every elected Republican leader to follow the clearly articulated wishes of Republican activists from all over the state and move Senate Bill 129 forward. Mary Margaret Oliver, um, 
uh, it's been pointed out that, you know, the business community now is more strongly united against this measure than ever, largely, I think, in reaction to what happened in Indiana last year when they passed a RIFRA up there. Uh, but it's been pointed out that people who, for instance, are, are Josh McCoon's constituents and people who are outside of Metro Atlanta don't much care about whether Arthur Blank can attract a Super Bowl to Atlanta or whether the business community can get its way with bringing in new business. He thinks it's that the people out there are concerned about their moral values. Is that a, a, a valid concern? I think they're more concerned about jobs than our budget and our economy. We have different views on moral values, about what is more valuable. <laughs> and it's a very interesting, as a former law professor, part-time law professor, it's a very interesting intellectual argument. The sophisticated constitutional discussion that Senator McCoon has brought to the House. I was on the subcommittee, the special committee, some of the backroom committees, and I spent probably 20 hours and finally began to understand what maybe 20 lawyers or 100 lawyers in Georgia understand, and Ms. Senator McCoon is one of them, the complexity of the weighing of constitutional values. But the people of Georgia are not in that mode, in my view, and they're certainly not in that mode in my district in DeKalb County. How do you read that out in your district, out in Lawrenceville? Well, my, my constituents, like Senator McCoon, support it. Uh, it's, my district may not be as conservative as his, but they still support it. I'm a co-sponsor of the House version of the mm -hmm. bill. Uh, I will proudly and gladly vote for it. I will gladly vote for Speaker Ralston's Pastor Protection Act. I think uh, Chairman Willard hit on something I, th I think is key. He mentioned that there are First Amendment protections, and that's why we don't need Senator McCoon's bill. Well, there are First Amendment protections. Uh, what we're dealing with here are Supreme Court rulings that have weakened that. And I think you, you study the history of RIFRA, religious, you know, as you called it, RIFRA, um, it's an attempt to bring it back to what we always understood the First Amendment to mean, and that is that the burden of proof is on the government. If there's going to be a violation uh, or something that infringes on someone's religious rights, then the government need to explain, needs to explain why that needs to happen. That's, you know, unfortunately, the, the rhetoric over this is becoming incredibly heated. It, it is. I mean, there's no way to have a calm conversation about 129 these days, is there, Greg? It's taken root in people's minds as either something that's needed from grassroots conservatives or something that's hated by business interests and gay rights groups, uh, which is why the new, the, the another measure, the First Amendment Defense Act, is becoming somewhat of a, of a big question mark because it hasn't really taken root in people's minds. You know, uh, he brings up an interesting point. Uh, you have gone to great lengths to say that your bill is not in any way intended to discriminate, particularly against gays and lesbians. I, I think there are people out there who don't agree with you on that. Nevertheless, you've now got a colleague in the Senate, Greg Kirk, who was on the show the other night, who's actually proposing going to propose legislation that would allow government officials, government workers, to, based on their own moral beliefs about gays and lesbians, say, refuse to issue a marriage license. Maybe revenue officers who are looking at processing state filings of income tax wouldn't uh, accept gay marriages as joint return. I mean, he's approaching this in a f really front-on way. Well, I think that the proposal about the First Amendment Defense Act, both at the federal level um, and here at the state level, illustrates what I've been saying about RIFRA all along. If RIFRA was being used in the manner that the opponents claim, there would be no need or no debate over a, uh, a proposed First Amendment Defense Act. I would say this, this notion that, that RIFRA is somehow bad for the economy, I think it's important to note uh, Governor Jindal in Louisiana, the day after uh, Indiana began to be subject to these boycotts, authored an op-ed in the New York Times, issued an executive order providing robust religious freedom protections for the people of Louisiana, dared basically for there to be a national boycott. No boycott occurred. Houston, Texas repealed an LGBT non-discrimination ordinance in November, and they are hosting the Super Bowl next year, and the NFL has taken no steps to take the Super Bowl away. So this notion that there's going to be some tie to a negative economic impact, just like the argument about discrimination, there's simply no evidence out there to support it. We're going to have to take a break in a second, but uh, Representative Oliver, uh, 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 let me ask you this. You were part of the process, as you say, in the House. An anti-discrimination amendment was proposed for SB 129, 
And uh, uh, you didn't want it, Senator McCoon. Uh, Representative Oliver, is there a little dissonance there if, if you want, won't, won't accept an anti-discrimination amendment but say that this doesn't discriminate against gays and lesbians? Is that a mixed message? It appears to be a mixed message on the surface, but once I finally began to understand the complexity of the constitutional argument, I began to understand why Senator McCoon would not accept an anti-discrimination amendment. I believe that the business community is an important factor in our politics. Uh, they clearly get a lot uh, done down there that they want. And when they are unified in their position, I'm not going to poo-poo Coca-Cola or Delta yeah. and call them names. Yeah. I think they are acting in the reasonable interest of the business climate of Georgia. And the proof has been shown, I believe, that Indiana lost over $600 million. All right, we're going to have to move on to a break in a second. But as long as you have the spotlight, one other uh, measure that <laughs> you're generating controversy around, you seem to not mind doing that at all. Uh, you already have a statute in Georgia that declares English as the official language of the state. Now you want to uh, uh, ask voters to vote on a constitutional amendment. Why? Well, it's the same reason that I supported uh, the 2014 constitutional amendment to cap Georgia's in income tax at 6%. We had a statute in place making 6% the top rate, but we wanted it enshrined in the Constitution so it would be difficult for a future in legislature. Perpetu in perpetuity. Right. You want it that way. Right. So that a future legislature would not retreat from a public policy position taken by a Democratic state legislature in the 1990s, which over the last 20 years has been very good for Georgians. All right. Uh, before we go to break, uh, Greg Bluestein, uh, that seems like a measure that might have a, I mean, you got to get two thirds in both houses. So it's a big uh, hurdle to uh, climb over. But this is a legislature that very well might be inclined to support that sort of measure. This is coming off a session where Republicans voted for a gas tax hike, where they failed to vote for religious liberty, where they legalized a form of medical marijuana. So there is a hunger among many Republican lawmakers who have to go back to face the voters they want, you know, conservative legislation like this. All right, look, we got to take a break. When we come back, uh, Buzz Brockway, Mary Margaret Oliver, you both have really interesting legislation that we ought to talk about as well. Uh, but for right now, we're going to take a, shake, sh a short break and uh, talk. come back on the other side to talk about more. But first, how well do you know your lawmakers? Representative Ron Mayo is a Democrat representing House District 84 in DeKalb County. He was elected to the Georgia General Assembly in 2008. Did you know that he appeared on Sesame Street as a child? And his dad was actor Whitman Mayo, best known for his role as Grady on Sanford and Son. Now you know. We'll be right back. We take our mission as public radio journalists very, very seriously, and we bring it to you in the most comprehensive, understandable, and the most accurate way that we know how. Join us weekday mornings at 9 a.m. for On Second Thought. Do you have Apple TV? Check out this exciting new way to access all your favorite content from GPB and PBS. It's GPB Now. Download the app and easily browse local and national shows, special series, sports, and more. All on demand and just a click away. Plus, stream live events like the high school championships and GPB Radio exclusive to GPB. If you're cutting the cable, stay connected with GPB now. Free to download in the Apple TV App Store today. Your corporate sponsorship of GPB lets all Georgians know of your support for quality programs that educate, inform, inspire, and entertain. Email us at sponsorship at gpb.org. Thank you. Did you know, although women make up 51% of Georgia's population, they hold only 23% of the House and Senate seats at the Georgia General Assembly? Welcome back to Lawmakers. I'm Bill Nygut. Guests tonight around the table include Senator Josh McCoon, Greg Bluestein of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, Representative Mary Margaret Oliver, 
and also Representative Bugs Brockway. By the way, we should say, Mary Margaret Oliver, you may not have a str the forces of women down there, but you are able with your strength down there to stand up for three. <laughs> That's very kind of you. 23% of the House and Senate are women, but 100% of the state's constitutional officers and 100% of our congressional district are all men. With our limited time, uh, uh, let's talk. You have an, you, you're one of the people down there who has a bill to uh, uh, make an impact on gun safety, on gun requirements. You have an assault weapons bill. Tell us very uh, briefly what you're proposing. Gun violence is an issue on people's mind, more so, in my judgment, as a Christian, than RIFRA values. Gun violence scares people. We had an incident in DeKalb County four miles from my house where a young mentally disturbed man walked into an elementary school, McNair Discovery Academy, with an AK-47 spraying bullets at the police. Those children were fortunate that day. No one was hurt based on the human skill of an employee. Children in Connecticut were not as fortunate with a different kind of assault weapon. I want to have a rational, open, intellectually honest discussion about gun violence in the Georgia General Assembly. Can you do that? Some people think I'm naive. Some people think that's foolish. I have respect for my colleagues. Mm -hmm. I want to have a rational, open, and intellectually honest discussion about assault weapons that the majority of Americans, according to the Pew Foundation polling data, wish to be banned. Where does that bill stand right now? It has been introduced. It's House Bill 731. We're having a good discussion in press conferences. We're having a good discussion from many different faith leaders and groups in support of the bill. And I look forward to a hearing and a rational discussion about what Georgia voters are afraid of. Greg, um, there's a bill. Keisha Waits was in here the other day. She has a bill about uh, training uh, for people uh, who want concealed weapons. Is there, is there going to be much movement on anything that people see as restricting their free access to weapons? It is a very tough climb for that, especially in an election year in, in a Republican-controlled state house. Okay. Josh McCoo, do you think there's going to be, at a certain point, uh, blowback from the public over the fact that legislators haven't been enthusiastic to have these open conversations, uh, intellectual uh, arguments that uh, Representative Oliver is talking about. At a certain point, could that be a, a, a problem for legislators? Well, I think we have been having um, an open and honest discussion when gun measures are introduced. Uh, Senator Stone uh, in the uh, Judiciary Non-Civil Committee, uh, we had extensive hearings on Senator Fort's bill uh, repealing Georgia's Stand Your Ground law. Um, I think we have those robust discussions. It's a natural human impulse to think we can legislate away the kind of tragedies uh, that you were just hearing about. Uh, but the truth of the matter is what we see in common in most of these situations is that they take place in places where uh, law-abiding citizens are banned from carrying weapons. All right, we're, we're going to watch this, and we want to invite you to come back as this bill moves or doesn't move uh, uh, through the legislature. But I want to turn to you with our short time, Representative Brockway, because you have an interesting bill, too. There's a lot of talk about this is the year that we ought to be expanding MARTA to further reaches of the suburbs. Whether that happens or not, you have a bill that would uh, pave the way for more development around existing uh, MARTA stations. Yeah, I introduced a constitutional amendment last year to create a new kind of community improvement district that I'd call a transit community improvement district or a TCID. And the idea would be around an existing MARTA stop. You would take, draw a circle with a half a mile radius and you create a CID in that area that would tax uh, the businesses in that area and use the revenue that you generate to, uh, to build rail. Now, I, I think this is a more conservative approach to expanding MARTA because you're, you know, the, the folks who benefit economically from a MARTA stop, uh, the businesses that are around there, are going to help uh, fund, the, fu fund the, uh, the expansion of it. Uh, we, I'm working on the uh, enabling legislation now, and we'll, we'll see how it goes in the legislature. But I hope this is you know, a, a, a more conservative way to get the state involved in, in funding. One other transit. quick question about that, though. Some of your Republican colleagues think that the idea of uh, helping MARTA expand, fi finding funding, whether it's through a CID or whatever, is really a good idea. Will, are, are you enthusiastic about any funding going to uh, expand MARTA? I don't know that we will appropriate anything. That's, you know, out of the scope of this. What I'm, you know, what I, what I hope is 
what I think Marta should do, my free advice, go to where cu their customers are. Why isn't there a, a stop near the Crog Street Market? What about the Ponce Market? What about, why, what, wouldn't it be great to have a line that, that went over to captured students at Morehouse or Spelman or some of the other in-town colleges? To, to expand it out to where I live in Gwinnett would be billions of dollars. Focus on there where you can increase ridership, and I hope my proposal can help them do we're, that. We're, we're, we, we've got, our discussion is uh, coming to an end, but I've got to tell you, you've painted a really interesting vision for uh, how a MARTA expansion could be uh, really tremendously valuable in the city. So we'll watch that as well. Uh, I want to thank you all uh, for being here uh, tonight. I want to talk for just a minute about the fact that we're getting close uh, the nation and the world, to the day that we pause to remember the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Last week, the King Center kicked off the festivities for King Week with a reception and dinner. Our Jackie Britton was there, and she joins us now with more. Hi, Jackie. Hey, Bill. That's right. I had the opportunity to talk with Dr. King's daughter, Bernice, at that dinner and reception. She talked, of course, about her father's legacy, but she also shared with me the reasons it's so important to keep her mother's legacy alive as well. I'm trying to do my best to uphold the things that I was taught by my mother in particular um, and carrying what I call her part of the legacy um, at this point because she did all the work to really form and fashion my father's legacy and now it's really time for her to shine forth and and so a lot of my reflection now is how can I help her legacy um, and and not let her get lost in, in all of this. What age do you think it was when you kind of really knew the you know, magnitude, magnitude of what of your mother. family has done? You know, um, 1985, I was uh, um, invited to be a part of a delegation that traveled to Russia for a World Peace Conference. I was um, 22 at the time, just graduated from Spelman College here in Atlanta. And uh, one night we were coming back from the stadium where we gathered uh, every night. And as I got off the train, I heard in the background, we shall overcome. And I was like, my God, you can't escape him or it. It's everywhere. Oh, you know, Because at 22, honestly, I was trying to run from the whole King identity because I'm still trying to find Bernice. I had, I had this call on my life into ministry, and I'm, I'm thinking, God, if I'm just going to ministry, I'm going to be overwhelmed with the in, inevitable comparisons with my father and what's going to happen to me. Yeah. So I was just running, and to hear that, I was like, wow. Then we attended a church there, Baptist Church, and after the service, the pastor met us, and he said, I have visited Atlanta, and I've met your mother and been to the King Center. I was like, oh, my God, you're right. kidding me. You're like, Hi, I'm Bernice. So yeah. at that point, I said, wow, you know, my, my, my father uh, and those in the movement have had an impact on the globe. I don't know if I was expecting her to be so candid, but it was awesome to chat with Bernice King. The official celebration of Dr. King's life and legacy will be this Monday, the national holiday. There are a number of events planned. Some of them are free and open to the public. So to find out more, be sure to visit www.thekingcenter.org. And here's an interesting fact. Did you know that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. got a C in public speaking when he was in school? That must have been one tough class. I learned that from a video they played at the reception, Bill. Thanks a lot, Jackie. You know, good for you, uh, Bernice King talking very openly and very personally, she which did. she doesn't do all the time, about her father and his legacy. So thanks so much for Thank that. You. Again, uh, my thanks to uh, Senator Josh McCoon, to Representative Buzz Brockway, to Representative Mary Margaret Oliver, and Greg Bluestein, it's great to have you back here with us on Wednesday and Thursday nights uh, when you're not out on the campaign trail. And uh, thanks again for being here tonight. So that does it for day four of the 2016 session. 36 legislative days to go. Be sure to catch our Capitol Report tomorrow night at 7. Next week, the Georgia General Assembly won't meet on Monday because of the MLK holiday, and Tuesday is reserved for budget hearings, so see, we'll see you again here next Wednesday night. But remember, Political Rewind will be on GPB Radio tomorrow at 3 p.m. You can hear a lot about what's going on politically in this state. 
As always, you can track us on Facebook and Twitter or check out our page at gpb.org slash lawmakers. You can find full episodes of all of our shows and other information. Good night. Thank <laughs> you.